All right, folks, apparently there is an increasing risk uh, that Lebanon may be sucked into uh, the war that is ongoing currently um, uh, in Israel between uh, the people of Gaza and the IDF. Now, I considered taking a break from talking about war in the Middle East today um, because I'm sure that most of the subscribers to this channel are getting tired of it. Um, you know, it's not like I'm getting a, a ton of hits on these anyway. Uh, and I did I, personally like I want to have a fun break. I want to talk about something fun. Uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the failures of uh, Brie Larson and Bob Iger uh, or just the uh, the clown show that is the U.S. Congress, uh, where this week the big stories are, are not, you know, what Congress is actually doing as far as their job is concerned. It was uh, a couple of uh, fist fights or potential fist fights uh, between or involving uh, both uh, people in the House and people in the Senate. And to be clear, this wasn't one fight. These are two separate stories about fights breaking out uh, in the U.S. Congress. But I'm not going to talk about those because really they don't matter at all. That's, I mean, that kind of is the story. Uh, as far as those fights in Congress go, is that, wow, this is the most, this is like actually the most compelling news to come out of Congress in years, because Congress is worthless. Um, frankly, you know, uh, Emperor Palpatine should have dissolved the Senate a long time ago. It serves no purpose. We know that every U.S. president pretty much rules by decree anyway. So moving on to the Middle East, um, there is a quote that I'm seeing bandied about quite a bit. Uh, from the Israeli uh, defense minister. I think his name is like Gallons or something, like G-A-L-L-A-N-Z. And uh, the quote is, what we did in Gaza, we can do in Beirut. And what that is is a warning uh, to uh, Lebanon, essentially, to keep Hezbollah on a leash. Uh, the Israelis are saying, clearly, you can see, we can do a lot of damage when we want to. Uh, as uh, you know, as is evident by the state of Gaza City, uh, which has pretty much ceased to exist. It is a pile of rubble. <clears throat> and the Israelis, if they wanted to, could destroy Beirut as well. And this is a sensitive time, considering that Beirut had already been destroyed once uh, and has taken a long time to rebuild. So I'm sure that's something that the people of Lebanon uh, are not in a rush to see happen again. But as we saw uh, during the Lebanese civil war when Israel involved themselves, uh, people do not take kindly to uh, Israel bombing their country. Even if ostensibly uh, the Israelis were trying to uh, uh, help certain sides of the Lebanese civil war, uh, you know, they were essentially picking sides and trying to fight, you know, parts of, uh, you know, certain factions and help other factions. The end result was that pretty much everyone in Lebanon agreed uh, that they did not want the IDF meddling in their country. They did not like the IDF bombing their country, uh, no matter what side they were on. It was like the one thing that could uh, liber or that could unify. Uh, uh, p supporters of the different factions of the Lebanese civil war across Lebanese society, people generally agreed, yeah, we don't want Israel here. And it's also fair to point out, and I don't want to make this a, uh, like a thesis on the Lebanese civil war. Uh, that was not my intention. I did not do nearly, I, I did not do a ton of research. Actually, I, well, I, I did no research on the Lebanese civil war before making this video. That wasn't my intention. I was just trying to introduce a little bit of context. Um, but I feel like it's uh, worth pointing out the Syrians also uh, were heavily involved in the Lebanese civil war and I think still had troops present in Lebanon up until like 2006, around there. And I think Israel pulled out their last troops in like maybe 2000 or 2002. Now, Lebanon is a fractured country to say the least. Uh, and the most... I guess uh, anti-Israel faction in the country is definitely Hezbollah, uh, which uh, controls southern Lebanon. Hezbollah is essentially its own state. The uh, Hezbollah's mm, sort of armed militia wing, from what I understand, more powerful and competent 
and I think more numerous in terms of actual troops than the official Lebanese military. And uh, from, from what I understand, um, a lot of their support originally grew from uh, resistance to Israeli involvement during the Lebanese Civil War. I believe that's, that was sort of Hezbollah's origin story. And so ever since then, they, uh, within Lebanese politics, their main thing, you know, despite the fact that they are, or no, I shouldn't say despite, um, related to the fact that they are geographically the closest to Israel, the area where they're the most popular is along the border with Israel. They are the Israel hawks within that society, if that makes sense. They're the ones who are the most itching for a fight with Israel. And they have their own military. So Beirut, in other words, uh, doesn't control what Hezbollah does. If Hezbollah decides to uh, start a war with Israel, and they've been having lots of skirmishes with Israel, Hezbollah launching, uh, you know, has been a sort of shelling Israel, and then Israel will launch some bombs back at Hezbollah in, in, you know, in southern Lebanon, and people are dying on both sides. Although it's not a full-scale war yet, it's kind of like uh, it kind of reminds me of when India and Pakistan, you know, they have their skirmishes uh, every couple of years. There's these border skirmishes, and they kill a bunch of people on both sides, and then they all sort of agree at, uh, to <clears throat> go back to the status quo. So getting back, coming full circle to the uh, original statement put out by the Israeli Defense Minister, what we what we did in Gaza, we can do in Beirut. Um, is kind of a it's it's just another well it's the same logic it's collective punishment um, you know there are a lot of people in uh, Gaza in fact it's the vast majority of people who never voted for Hamas in an election I've went, gone over this before there was one election way back 2006 you know blah 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 uh, majority of the population is under 18 anyway and uh, these people you know in order to vote you would have had been over 18 in 2006 and even then, Hamas only won, you know, 44% of the vote, blah, 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 blah. And so what happened was Hamas launched an attack on Israel, and Israel says, okay, it's open season on all Gazans. We're going to kill them all. In fact, the Israeli minister of agriculture uh, had ca has called this Nakba 2023, which uh, all Nakba is a uh, – I believe it's an Arab term uh, for uh, – the ethnic cleansing of Arabs back in 1948. And it also um, resulted in their towns being wiped off the face of the earth, all their houses demolished, new towns put up in their place. Every, um, every uh, sort of uh, bit of evidence that they ever existed, that they ever lived there, was erased. And that is how the Israeli uh, agriculture minister uh, is describing what's going on in Gaza right now. Then you have the defense minister, a different guy, saying that we can do the same thing uh, in Beirut. Well, again, you have a similar situation to where you have Hamas, which is a faction within Gaza, uh, who launched an attack on Israel. And then Israel responds with collective punishment uh, equally punishing two million people, only a handful of which had anything to do uh, with uh, the attack on the uh, Israeli people. And now we have them threatening, quite credibly, they're making a similar analogy to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah is one faction within Lebanese politics. They are arguably a bigger faction in Lebanon than Hamas is in Gaza. Um, of course, it's hard to tell because Gaza doesn't have an actual political system. Israel has not permitted them to have an election uh, since 2006. Lebanon does have somewhat regular elections, and uh, Hezbollah has a substantial minority um, population who uh, supports them. But then you have uh, the vast majority of people in Lebanon who uh, – did not vote for Hezbollah, and it's not like Hezbollah is, you know, in control of the central Lebanese government. They're not. They just have an area down in the south where they are, uh, you know, the sort of the, the local dominant faction. But then even within them, uh, it's uh, 
not necessarily true that every civilian there consents to Hezbollah starting a war with Israel uh, that will result in uh, the destruction of their towns and you know, whatnot. And so no matter how you slice it, uh, there's no real way to, to defend um, you know, Israel's collective punishment strategy because it would be one thing if you said, okay, well, it's immoral, but it works. Historically, it's not worked. The collective punishment strategy has – every time it's been employed by Israel or anyone else, all it does is it creates more people who hate you. You galvanize uh, your own enemies. It's what uh, I believe Stanley McChrystal called insurgency math uh, to where you, you, you off one insurgent, let's say, in a drone strike. And guess what? You you create 20 more because, you know, in that in, in trying to kill that one insurgent, uh, you slaughtered, let's say, 50 civilians to get to him. Well, those those 50 civilians have brothers and fathers and sons uh, and, and nephews and cousins. And those guys who might not have cared about the war beforehand, now that it's affected them, say, you know what? Um, uh, uh, death to America. Or death to Israel. They bring death to, to my village. Well, I'll bring death to them. And the cycle of vengeance continues. Israel says, you take 1,400 of our people, we'll take 11,000 and counting of yours, including 4,000 children, allegedly. That's what's happened in Gaza. Beirut, apparently, might be next. And actually, if you're specifically talking about Beirut, uh, you know, it's, the, it's a pretty fairly cosmopolitan city. Um, you know, Hezbollah, um, more conservative and austere. Um, I'm not even sure how much support Hezbollah has in Beirut. I would think that Hezbollah probably has less support in Beirut overall than they do the country at large. I don't know that. I'm just guessing at this point. Uh, I didn't again. I did not deeply research, uh, you know, the most recent Lebanese election maps or anything like that. Uh, but uh, I mean, hell, think about it this way. I mean, one of the um, uh, three major ethno-religious groups uh, in Lebanon are the Maronite Christians, who, if I remember correctly, uh, that's who Israel was trying to help, you know, quote unquote, during the Lebanese civil war. Of course, the Maronites are in a much weaker position now than they were before the Civil War. Um, I, I don't know if that's necessarily um, because of Israel's intervention uh, or not. Um, you know, they might have just very well ended up in the same position anyway because of demographics or whatever else. But surely a lot of them are going to be killed um, if you turn Lebanon or Beirut in particular uh, into Gaza. And as we've seen, plenty of churches have exploded in Gaza. Um, crushed under Israeli bombs. And then you have the Sunnis, who also are not affiliated with Hezbollah, because I, I should have pointed this out. Hezbollah is an um, uh, overtly Shia group. Uh, they model themselves very much after Iran. The, uh, their leader, Nasrallah, dresses like the Ayatollah. It's kind of cute. And Hezbollah is actually the one group I can think of where, because Israel says that everyone is working for Iran. Everyone is a secret puppet of Iran. Hezbollah is like the one case where that's actually true, uh, because these are just, you know, they are Iran fanboys. Uh, they like Iran, um, and, you know, that's their thing. And so, yes, Hezbollah does work very close with Iran. Uh, but in almost every other case, that is way overblown, and in fact, sometimes this is just a completely made-up uh, idea that Israel basically speaks into existence. Uh, good examples like the Houthis. The Houthis uh, were just a local group in Saudi Arabia uh, who, uh, you know, had a beef with uh, the Saudi puppet government in their country. Israel decided that because they wanted to be friends with Saudi Arabia uh, that they wanted to just tell everyone, oh, the Houthis, they're puppets of Iran because they don't like Saudi Arabia. And, you know, who would ever... Uh, criticize Saudi Arabia of all places, except for an Iran puppet. 
And so the Houthis had, like, no contact with Iran ever um, until, like, years into the, the Yemen War, after they had been completely cut off from the rest of the world, they started talking to Iran, and they're like, well, I guess you guys are, are the only people <laughs> uh, who are willing to speak to us. Could you help us out getting some weapons? And Iran's like, ah, sure, what do we have to lose? And so Iran was able to make a new friend because Israel just spoke their alliance into existence. And so now you have Yemen, which is a very weak and destroyed country, but a country nonetheless uh, that is um, uh, that has essentially been gaslit into being Iran's ally by Israel. Uh, same was true uh, to a certain extent uh, for Syria. Uh, Syria is because it was so heavily destroyed and um, uh, degraded by uh, America's. Uh, regime change war that they launched against Assad. Assad has, you know, is very much indebted to the Iranians as well as the Russians, uh, because without them, without their steadfast support, Assad would be dead today. He wouldn't just be deposed; he would be dead. Uh, he would have been, um, uh, you know, sodomized with a bayonet to death, Gaddafi style. So anyway, currently Lebanon, as far as I can tell, all of Israel's really worried about Iran. Um, Hezbollah is the big pro-Iran faction, and Hezbollah, again, from what I understand of the historical record, uh, a lot of their rise to prominence was a direct reaction to Israel. Hezbollah became popular because people in southern Lebanon uh, felt threatened by Israel because Israel was occupying that part of the country, and they wanted to support whoever was against Israel. Well, Israel, now you have a, uh, you know, you have Iran's uh, best friend on your border. They don't control the whole country, but you know what? Maybe if you want the entire country of Lebanon to um, hate you with an even stronger passion, uh, with an, you know, as strong a passion as, you know, Hezbollah hates you, uh, and you want all of Lebanon to just uh, unquestionably love the big boogeyman, Iran, go ahead and turn... Beirut into Gaza. If that's really what you want to achieve, uh, who am I to stand in your way? I literally can't stand in your way. <laughs> but again, this is an example of just Israel um, acting out of vengeance, but without putting much thought into it. What they're doing in Gaza, um, I don't think, unless they find somewhere to dump all of the Gazans and truly get them out of there for good. Uh, this is not going to help them in the long run um, because it's going to make that population more hostile. And the same is true with Lebanon. Unless they can just completely, what are they going to do if they destroy Lebanon and turn uh, and, and, and just, you know, they're just going around kicking hornets' nests. So after you've enraged these people and destroyed their lives in Lebanon, what, what do you do with them? Where Are you going to send them somewhere else? I don't get it. So this is truly self-destructive behavior on Israel's part. Um, just trying to turn everyone they possibly can against them. And, you know, it doesn't make me happy to see that. I don't like to see any government... Um, well, I, I like to see governments self-destruct, but I don't like to see governments self-immolate and take their population down with them. You know, if governments um, commit suicide um, by means of world war, that's that's an awful catastrophe. If governments commit suicide via bankruptcy and they just, you know, fade into the ether or they just pretty much shut down one day and never open back up, a la, like, East Germany. You know, one day East Germany just said, yeah, you know what, that whole Berlin Wall thing, ah, screw it. And then, like, overnight, pretty much, even though officially it still existed for a few more months, uh, pretty much overnight, there was no more GDR. Forty years of history, gone. So anyway, with that said, uh, I will see you folks back here tomorrow.